Uh, hello, um, my name is Eric Wade, and I'm here today with uh, author uh, Dan Walker, Alaskan author, and we're going to talk about books, and we're going to talk about our writing, and we also have a teaching background, both of us, in public schools, and we at one time were both high school English teachers, and so we're going to talk about that as well, and the title of this session is uh, Teachers Turned Writers. Um, I um, I have spent, I live in Wasilla, so that's my home base, and uh, I've spent the last 40 some years living here, and, uh, but during those 40 years, a very big part, a big focus of my life and my family has been a, a small, remote piece of property in interior Alaska, and <clears throat> that is the basis of all my writing to this point. Everything I've done has had something to do with our little homestead on a small river up uh, between uh, Denali and the Yukon River. And so uh, I started writing after, uh, really started writing uh, seriously after, uh, in just recent years. But in 2019, I um, had a book published by Moonshine Cove Publishing uh, titled Cabin. I'll just show you a photo of it here. Uh, an Alaska Wilderness Dream. And that was my first, the first thing that I completed and, and had published. And it's about, uh, it's obviously about our homestead I was mentioning, but it's also, uh, it's about in, in many ways, dreams that are not realized and how that is actually sometimes okay. Or, and maybe often is okay. Sometimes we want to do things perhaps we shouldn't do. And that's what that book uh, is about, frankly. And then in uh, 2022, <clears throat> I had a book about, published by Shanty Arts Publishing and uh, they're in uh, Brunswick, Maine, but uh, titled Upstream. And Upstream is uh, 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 also a memoir, but it's a story of uh, my wife and I's you know, trips out there to the woods and how growing older can Im impact uh, those things. And I tried to look at it from just a little broader than that, that how aging can affect all of us. We're, it's not related to just running to a homestead. It can be all of us face it in some way or another. And then uh, thirdly, I just had published, I don't even have a copy of it. The book has not made it to Alaska yet. It's just been released. Uh, into uh, paperback and ebook, but I don't have a hard copy yet. And it's called Squirrel Land, Imagination and the Alaska Red Squirrel. And it's, uh, it's a, the, the little uh, characters that run around our cabin out there in the wilderness, but also of course around here in, um, it's called urban Alaska. It's not really urban, but so, so to speak, you know. And that that is the story about, uh, Squirrels, and I want to read from that later on in our in uh, in this uh, session today. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that and turn it to you, Dan. Tell us about yourself. All right. Good morning, Eric. Uh, good morning, good evening, folks. Um, it's uh, nice to talk to an old another old ex teacher turned writer. Um, yeah. The uh, and as we as our hair grays and uh, starts to look like the snow on the mountains, it's uh, good to sit back and start writing. And when I started doing that, I thought it would be a lot easier than it is. It's uh, It has to be a labor of love. Uh, I was raised on the Kenai Peninsula and went to high school in Anchorage and uh, then went off to college. And uh, when I came home, my wife and I visited Seward in 1978 and we're still here. Um, and I taught school here and did a lot of uh, working, mentoring uh, in the bush as well. And uh, then I settled in to start my writing career. Uh, <clears throat> I always wanted to, to write, um, but I was kind of a lazy writer and just the physical act of sitting down and putting words on paper was not something I was willing to do as a child or as a young man, but I would make up great stories in my head. Uh, and then, uh, I started teaching and ended up teaching a lot of middle school and middle school has lots of reluctant writers who I could relate to. 
and uh, teaching writers kind of got me going with uh, being a, becoming a writer myself. Uh, my first, uh, I in 1979, I published my first uh, article in uh, the Alaska Magazine. And interestingly enough, Eric, this relates to a wilderness cabin because it's uh, it's called Open to Entry and Me, and it's the misadventures of me and my buddy going off to stake open to entry land in the Alaska wilderness. Mm-hmm. and all the things we did wrong and the mud holes and uh, but I did end up with that land and have my own cabin in the wilderness up on <laughs> Fair Lake uh, where I it's a fun place to sit and write um, but my first book to come out was Secondhand Summer which was uh, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to uh, win the uh, Alaska the Anchorage Daily News Writing Contest with uh, the first few couple chapters of Secondhand Summer, and that kind of opened the eyes to a publisher who would be interested in telling this story. And this is a story of uh, my move from the Alaska homestead to the big city of Anchorage. And so it's a reverse adventure story where I was dropped into the milieu of uh, urban Anchorage in 1965 um, as a kid from the homestead. And it's about a summer of misadventures uh, based on those experiences. Uh, since then, I've uh, published the, the with Alaska Northwest Books, I've published the sequel, which is uh, more out of, more uh, less autobiographical, but it's a story of, that has a lot about uh, the conflict in the late 60s uh, when we were protesting the Vietnam War or our brothers were off fighting in Vietnam, which was in my case. And it's about a the conflict that happens in families and how those, how we survive those. Um, And then uh, maybe my favorite book, but that's hard to say that way, is uh, my family memoir that I will read from later that is uh, called Letters from Happy Valley. And it is wrapped around the letters that my parents wrote uh, in 1958 and 59 when they moved, when we all moved to Alaska from Southern Ohio. And uh, we discovered this trove of letters a few years ago and uh, just opened this whole door of family history to me that I didn't know was there. Kind of a uh, uh, a wonderful little treasure chest. Uh, Now I still have projects that I'm working on. I have the sequel to Second Hand Summer and Back Home coming out hopefully by Christmas time. where I continue the story of Sam Barger and his adventures and misadventures uh, growing from a kid to being a young man. Um, And uh, I'm sure like you, Eric, it's always a toss up between wood getting and cabin work and writing, right? Yeah, right, right. I thought it was interesting. You you mentioned that you enjoyed writing at your cabin. Um, um, I, I, myself, I find it kind of, I like to, uh, researched at the cabin, but I actually find it hard to sit down and write there. I, mm-hmm. I, seems, I seem to uh, have better concentration if I'm at home here in my little space. In but I, uh, it's a great place to read uh, for me. And uh, one, uh, Dan, a question I had, because I, I, I really enjoyed both of those books. I have not read your memoir, but Secondhand Summer and Back Home. And um, one question, and for a number of reasons, but one is this uh, in both the connection with the Vietnam War, because I uh, I'm not a, I'm not a vet, but I've always been very interested in Vietnam literature, and there's been some great writers who have have tackled yeah. those. And I was wondering if you would explain your connection with that and why you write have written about that. Sure. Um, well. Um... I was a child of the 60s, and uh, I graduated from high school in 1971, uh, which meant that I was in high school and impressionable just when all the drama, kind of like today, that people were on one side of the political issue or the other in a lot of ways. You were for the war or you were against the war. There weren't very many people standing in the middle. And uh, uh, my brother, uh, Bill, I've always... I always thought he was six years older than I. Um, and I was, after my father died, it was very hard on him. And I think 
that was part of his reaction to our father's death that he joined the Marines. And he, of course, ended up going off to Vietnam and uh, participated in some of the worst uh, battles that took place in Vietnam, like Khe Sanh, which is one of the famous ones. And uh, he uh, he came home physically unscathed, but his but brutalized in the mind. Um, he suffered from PTSD, PTSD severely, and of course, being a man of that era he would never admit to it um and it just created a lot of pain and anguish for him and i really attribute it to his early death um so at the same time i was i was the long-haired kid who was against the war um, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh because of that it uh, it just seemed a natural to write back home with that kind of perspective about two brothers on either side of the war and the challenge that creates because you're still brothers you still love each other and um, my brother and I stayed very close uh, until he passed, um, and the uh, and that's one of the the realities that I think is hard to teach in a history class um, that we like we'd like young people to learn to understand. I think. Yeah, I uh, I also graduated from high school in 1971, and I also have a brother who's six years older, um, and so in your book. Um, back home, which is, uh, to me, really a, uh, a, a sibling relationship, a uh, book about sibling relationships, and, and it's really well done. And the I just, I don't know, give the story away to people who haven't read it, it's very good. But the final chapter, uh, the final, at the ending of the book is particularly strong, in my opinion, because I of tying uh, a hunting trip with a uh, you know, a skirmish in uh, in the war was uh, pretty cool, and you did a nice job of that. Um, I really enjoyed that book. Um, it's, it's interesting you say that. Um, I really uh, I like that part too, and it's interesting. It's something that some of the reviewers criticized me for was the ending of my book, the way I ended it. Um, oh. they, some people were left unsatisfied, um, while I always. My response to that was always telling people that, you know, the 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 story's never over, you know, in any book that you read or that you write, there's always more story that you could yeah. tell. And it's just decide you decide when to say, when to write the words, the end, yeah. when there's a point at which we can say, okay, that's all you need to know right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, the, the end of that just... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, I won't get into how it ends, but there's the line well, in the end when he tosses him, I think it was a candy bar. Anyway, I just love that line. I did. I thought that was so, uh, I, as a, uh, uh, you know, having siblings myself and having a brother myself and four sons myself, those relationships are are pretty remarkable. And you did a nice job with that. Thank you. How, um, how did teaching, so how did um, the way you were taught uh, when you were a kid. Did, did, were, did that inspire you to be a writer? Or, or did you think you would be a writer when you were coming out of high school? Well, in uh, high school, you? yes. Uh, because I left high school with the intent of going into journalism. Um, my, I didn't really enjoy high school. I was always looking forward to when I would be out of high school and I wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, but I really enjoyed uh, my journalism program. And Mrs. Grant, the journalism teacher, uh, was, we just, that's where I learned most of my writing. Most of my English classes were either loosey goosey, just write what you want uh, kind of classes, or they were all grammar focused, and which made you just hate anything related to language, at least for me. Um, so, there was a lot of things that made me think, I don't want to get into the milieu of writing, but in journalism, because in journalism, you're just, you're just telling a story. You're just finding out the story and telling it in a very succinct, straightforward way. And I really enjoyed that. Once I got to college, I went down a different road, but um, I think the, uh, some of the things I learned in Mrs. Grant's journalism classes are still with me. Yeah. Yeah. I know for, um, for me, I uh, uh, quite similar in that I, I was inspired. I wanted to be a journalist as well, and I 
as an undergraduate, I, um, I actually, I, um, wanted to find a newspaper writing job because in those days you could be a writer and a newspaper. There were newspapers out there doing that. And I landed a teaching job first. That's what happened. Huh. And, uh, and I'm still, when I went to, uh, graduate school, um, I majored in journalism at the University of Oregon. And so I got my, uh, so I stayed in, interested in it too. In those days, uh, and this is history, this is before the pro proliferation of, of MFA programs and so forth. Journalism was a place where a lot of wannabe writers went and it may still well be that way, I don't know. I've been away from it, but uh, my sense is that MFA programs have perhaps taken that place. and. Uh, it seems rightfully so because there just isn't the same kind of work for journalists as it's different anyway than it was back uh, 45 years ago or so, whenever that was. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting you say that because um, today when uh, my wife and I read a lot of the same books and we agree that often some of our favorite nonfiction books are ones that are written by journalists. There is a certain clarity of language that they have. The, yeah. these seasoned writers that are that have to write every day quickly and efficiently that yeah. end up being really uh, engaging writers at least for me um, i think so too tell me uh, about about you and teaching and writing and how those work together for you well for me i um like i was um i can think of three kind of three specific incidents that uh, re related to how teachers impacted me. Uh, one was my uh, uh, an Eng English teacher in high school named Mrs. Browning, who is now passed on, but she was a wonderful teacher. She wasn't necessarily the nicest lady to me because I wasn't, uh, you know, I was, uh, I don't know. I, I may not have always paid attention, but what she uh, wanted, uh, what she did was uh, get across to me that writing was something that was important to do to know how to do so. She did a nice job of that. And so by the time, and so I, I kind of took that to heart and and then um, and then I had a teacher as a senior in high school who was the first one to really give me a sense that maybe I could actually do it some. And then a college instructor who, uh, this probably happens to lots of people, but it hadn't to me where I had a paper, you know, pulled out of the stack that he happened to like that he shared with the class. And I really, that meant a lot to me because it was not something that you know, very happened uh, ever before. So that was a, a great experience. I think um, <clears throat> teaching writing, when I, uh, you know, one of the things that being an English teacher, uh, one way it helped me was um, I did more reading. As an English teacher, I became a, a much better reader. I just, uh, you know, and and I think in the long run, that probably helped me more than the actual lessons I was teaching or that sort of thing. Yeah. Because you sometimes, uh, you know, you just don't get to the level of, I didn't as a high school teacher, where you're really moving into a professional kind of, uh, you know, plane. And so, but once I, but but by turning to the good authors out there, you know, you get there in a hurry. And that, that made a lot of difference to me. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, the, that idea, um, because I spent a lot of years working as a uh, teacher mentor for beginning teachers. And one yeah. thing I, I noticed with uh, English teachers was that they were often really well grounded in literature and often grammar, but hadn't received any training in how to teach people to write, which is kind of the, the cornerstone of communication. Is, is yeah, writing. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time uh, helping them discover resources and some skills at teaching kids to write because they just thought they were just going to teach liter literature. Yeah. And often that's why they were in English, because they were avid readers and really into literature. Yeah. Well, certainly, I think it's... Uh... There's, uh, you know, it's pretty clear to me that those students who exit high school, who have, uh, you know, pretty decent writing skills, will do better 
in uh, post-secondary education. It just, to be able to write your, get some ideas down on paper, just moves you further ahead. You know, this. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, did you, um, you mentioned you did some, did, did you have some writing projects underway while you were teaching? Did you have time to do that? Um, well, my, my first time I decided I'm going to go try and be a writer. Um, uh, my wife and I took a, took a year off from both our jobs and went down and spent a winter in New Mexico. Um, and part of what I was doing there was I decided I was going to be a writer. And I, I wrote uh, a Western novel because I, because I knew I had read all those when I was a young man. And I said, those are easy. I could write one of those. And I sat down and wrote one. Wasn't able to sell it to anybody, but I wrote it. And which uh, did two things. One, it taught me that, yes, I could sit down and write, you know, 50,000 words. Um, and it wouldn't drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, and that, in fact, I would enjoy it. Um, and uh, the... Um, but when I came back and went back into teaching, as you know, teaching is pretty a full absorption kind of activity. But I would, but in the summer, the following summer, I started writing during the summertime. Yeah, yeah. But other than then, uh, one project I did that I think really helped move me along was I was teaching uh, gifted students. And there was a program called Written and Illustrated, which was kind of a, a, a structured program to where you would guide your students all the way through the process of coming up with a story idea and writing and illustrating a book. And then this was before computer times and you would actually print it out and then stitch it together and put a cover on it and actually physically make a, a, a picture book. And I did that with my students and I did one along with my students. And I think it inspired me as much or more as it did with the students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, the literary magazines and things as a teacher are always a lot of fun to do and those big writing projects for sure. I know when I, uh, <clears throat> after I, when I first moved to Alaska, um, I wanted, I, I wanted to be a writer, you know, that's what I said, I was looking for this job or that job. And so I did uh, some freelance writing back then. So this would be in the mid 20s, my, my mid 20s. <laughs> and, um, you know, Alaska Magazine and some, uh, you know, Fisherman Magazines and that kind of thing. But, um, it, you know, the money wasn't great by any means. You know, you get 100 bucks or 50 bucks or something for an article. I can't, you know, that's probably about what I was getting for my writing. And uh, and then I just got caught up in teaching, as you say. And, uh, and then so writing went on the back burner for, you know, 30 years essentially that kind of thing so yeah um what do you find uh dan the most difficult about writing now i mean as a oh i would say the two two most difficult things one um is getting clean copy <laughs> i am i'm a terrible proofreader um so that's one challenge it's a real concrete challenge the other is is less concrete and that is uh, marketing marketing my work and finding a uh, finding a place to sell give away or or whatever my my work because that is not only difficult um but it's time consuming and it's also energy consuming um i think people a lot of people have this idea that we sit and uh write a good story or a good book and then we hit print and we send it off to someone and Someone goes, oh, this is wonderful. Let's turn it into a book and a movie and uh, give you lots of money. Um, yeah. And that part is- Hasn't happened yet. Yes. Yeah. 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 I have I have projects where I think I've spent more time trying to market them than I've spent actually working on them. <laughs> you know, the uh, um, I don't know if you had this experience early on or not with your writing, but- when I when I finished writing Cabin, like the first draft of Cabin, um, I was uh, a bit delusional in thinking that it was pretty good, 
And, uh, you know, I wrote, I finally have it done. There it is. Um, and um, I sent it to some friends and people I thought would, you know, be interested in helping me read it. And I, I basically owe them an apology because it was so bad at that stage that it, it really shouldn't even have been sent out. And that's one of the things that I've learned about it is I won't do that again. And I, I kind of, I mean, nobody complained, but I real came to a point where I realized after so many revisions and changes, I knew the first uh, version couldn't have been very good. And so I think it's very important, and it is for me to spend, uh, make sure what I send, when I decide to send it off for comment, that it's in a stage where I actually need some assistance. I, I need people then to look at it, not just find mistakes that I made and and didn't do a proper job of proofreading myself. Yeah, because I find that a problem as well as as really getting a really clean copy for somebody to look at and mm -hmm. comment on. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, and that, that feeling that we have, and I think you have to, you know, I was, I was at a writer's conference this weekend and did a presentation. And one thing, the thing I told people, I said, you have to love your own writing. And if you don't love it, you need to work on it until you do. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I think that that's, that can get in your own way because, you know, if you write, a sentence you wrote that sentence because you thought it was a good sentence and you and you like it and so you gotta uh leave it alone and come back to it and reevaluate it and sometimes that really helps and like you said sometimes you need somebody else to tell you that yeah um, so did, do you did you do that with your book set like uh secondhand summer did you set it aside and come back to it yeah i did and okay. um uh i also had you know like back secondhand summer was and I think because I had worked it so long and so thoroughly um it stayed pretty well intact back home <clears throat> once it got in the hands of the editors we made major changes to that a lot of major rewrites in back home uh, mm -hmm. for instance we uh, we introduced the female character in back home after the editor encouraged that um and well she was there but they said make her more part of the story i think you need to integrate that so there's there were lots of changes i made to that after it was quote finished um mm -hmm. so it, it really varies a lot that way yeah there are three interesting female characters that come to mind in that book uh the the first the high school student who he had to partner with and then the of course the main character the the brown-eyed uh uh, young beauty and I can't think of her name and then uh, uh, Julie who uh, who worked at the pizza party yeah. yeah yeah three three good female characters in there yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, originally the 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 girl in the pizza parlor was the only real girl that stood out and you know as a, you remember being a young man who didn't have that girl that you had that crush on right that mm -hmm. was just older and out of reach but she yeah. lets you see what an ideal woman was. <laughs> yeah, maybe. yeah. No, it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good book. I really like that. Now, so you can you give us a can you give us a little peek into what story you're exploring with your squirrel book? Yeah, I know that Alaskans all have intimate relations with squirrels. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I uh, in recent years, and and it's. I guess there's a political uh, bit of a spin on this, I suppose, but I uh, I have I'm frankly tired of it as a as a viewer of television and and on and on and on. But it's, it has struck me that we have a fascination. We only have fascinations about things that are big. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be important. You have to be rich. You have to be a celebrity. You in order to really garner any attention at all in this world almost that's what it seems like and so um i i decided uh, i i started began to witness things about squirrels that i thought i'd like to write about because i happen to believe that squirrels demonstrate that you don't have to be a a giant among things in order to be 
a monarch yourself, you know. So that is the general theme of Squirrels, Squirrel Land. But it's it's also, it's not a memoir, but my wife and I are in it. And the photography is, uh, Doyle Ann's her name. She made, she took all the photos. And uh, so there's like 44 photos, color photos in the book. Um, but it's Squirrel Land is the location of uh, where this book takes place. And, and so it's, it also talks about the other animals around there, some of them. And, uh, but it's really about uh, that. That's the theme of that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And so we'll see, you know, we'll okay. see how that comes across and so forth. But I, uh, I, I really think it's a, uh, we could rethink that, you know, as a, as people, we could rethink that and start to look at other things to to, to uh, maybe put our pay our attention to a bit than a handful of celebrities or a handful of politicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the red squirrel is a good place to start. I can see yeah. some interesting yeah. analogies there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dan, you write fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference for those? between those? Well, um, I I really like the adventure of writing uh, fiction and just, and I'm what they call in the writing business, a pantser, in that I tend okay. to have an outline or a plan when I start writing. I enjoy that adventure of what if this happened? Um, yeah. Bert, and I'll, I'll give you an example. We're like, right now I have this story rolling around in my mind um, uh, at, set in um, uh, 150,000 years ago uh, when man is first still using fire and um, the idea that this this group uh, loses this kid who's supposed to take care of the fire messes up and the fire goes out and um, he's sent off to find more fire. Um, mm -hmm for the group and uh, I call it the fire thief. And I just, I like finding an idea of this what if, and then sending this, sitting down and starting this person off on an adventure and deciding, okay, what's gonna, what's over the next hill kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so in that, I, fiction is a great escape. And that goes all the way back to my youth because I used to, I used to have trouble going to sleep at night and that's how I would put myself to sleep at night and making up stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, is that something you're working on right now? Is that no, it? it's, well, I made some notes because I didn't want to, for, to lose the ideas, but yeah. I have, but it's, I'm actually working on a, I'm working on a middle grade, uh, uh, kind of a silly middle grade, uh, fiction adventure story uh, okay. and middle grade for people who don't know means for kids like eight to 12 years old. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, secondhand summer is clearly to me, a middle grade book um, or maybe young adult, maybe it branches to the, into that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I had my own caribou lounge or what you could. Yeah. Uh, it, it was an abandoned church, you know, so I mean, those kind of things where the kids go and explore these places and, um, but uh, Home Alone or uh, Back Home is, uh, I think that's, I, th I think that's, an, uh, to me, that's an adult novel, mm -hmm. I, or certainly young adult novel. I, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, definitely, I mean, and, um, and, and so is the, and the sequel will be too. Um, in the sequel, which has the the long name of the One Man Iris Davis Fan Club, um, yeah. And, uh, well, it's not a it's not a uh, giveaway because it comes up in the first pages that uh, Sam Barger's girlfriend Iris, who is in back home, right? They get right. back together, and Iris gets pregnant, and uh, I wanted to explore teenage pregnancy in that era. Okay. and um, how the world dealt with it and the challenges yeah. it created. So that's kind of the focus of that story. 
Well, Dan, we're kind of getting to where maybe we should do our readings. I'm just I looking like at idea. Yeah, I think so. Do you would you like to go first or sure? And then you can finish up with, with the squirrels. You're gonna read some from the squirrel I'm book. I'm gonna read from the squirrel book, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. That'll be a good way to wrap us up. I'm gonna read from the uh letters from Happy Valley. Um okay. and uh, give people a little bit of sample of that. I'm going to read the pre the preface and because most people don't read the preface of a book and then I'm going to read the first chapter I think. A few years ago when I was already much too old to be a hero of an adventure story, a packet of letters started me on a quest. A quest not for gold or lost cities but for answers, for lost years and for stories. These letters were more than 50 years old and for me represented a wormhole back to 1958 when I was five years old. I was being offered a chance few people get to relive a time in my life that I barely remembered. For these were not just, hi, the weather's fine, I miss you kind of letters. These were journal-like narratives penned by my mother and father during our family's move from Ohio to Alaska. What a treasure trove for me. These letters offered a chance to know my dad who died when I was young and our life in the woods was still an adventure story and a possibility. As I read, my parents' distinct writing style came through and I could hear their voices rise from the pages. Once more, I was a five-year-old boy with a toothache and too many questions on the highway to Alaska. I read the packet of letters in one sitting, stretching my night far into the morning as I followed the story I had once lived. Tucked in my parents' letters were other letters from my brothers and sisters, and even one from me transcribed by my brother Bill. As the months of 1958 passed, I found where I had written Danny in the margin of a letter, and then later, a short letter in my own hand. When I read the last of the letters, I knew I would return to that time and tell a story of a family from Ohio who crossed the continent and started a new life in a wild new land. A memoir began to take shape in my mind. A shared writing between my parents and me created nearly 60 years apart. In this process, the letters opened memories and memories led to conversations and conversations led to introspection. I looked with different eyes at the topography and the ecology of the land we settled, at the homesteaders who came and stayed, as well as the homesteaders who came and left. And then finally I wrote, I wrote what I remembered. I wrote what I discovered in the letters and of the people who penned them. I wrote the shared stories of a family as I searched for my father. I wrote about the homesteaders and the frontier, and I realized that the first Americans, from the first Americans to the immigrants of the 21st century, we are a country made of people who packed up and left some other place to come here. This is the story of one such family, and in so many ways, the ideal pioneers. <clears throat> Chapter one. On New Year's Day, 1959, Chet Walker awoke early and crossed the cold floor to build a fire in the kitchen range and add wood to the coals left in the box stove. For the third day in a row, the temperature had dropped below zero. So he slipped on some wool socks and slippers and stepped out the back door to pee. A sound drew his attention to the willows along the skid road he'd opened, <clears throat> where he'd cut trees for the cabin. In the dim light of early dawn, he could see a moose feeding. He didn't dawdle on the back step, but left to mo the moose to its browsing and went back to the stove, where he found the firebox crackling and the heat coming to him. He set the percolator on the cooktop, grabbed a wool shirt, and stepped back to the door to look for the moose. The back of the cabin looked out on a virgin forest of spruce trees that pushed their Christmas tree tops into the horizon of a growing dawn. He had cut more than a hundred of those trees to build the cabin. And today with the winter building snowbanks and cold spells all around them, the walkers had turned the new year in their new cabin in the Alaska woods. This was the home Chet and Briar had dreamed of and planned for during the 17 years they were married. True, no one was bringing in a paycheck and the kids had to be fed and clothed, but that could all be solved. When the coffee started perking, 
Chet moved it to the back of the stove and lit a cigarette and then retrieved a can of carnation evaporated milk from the cold windowsill and set it beside the sugar bowl and the spoon as he waited for his coffee. Even from inside the cabin, he could hear the moose tearing at the willows. Along with the crackling fire and the perking coffee, it was all he could hear that winter morning. Soon it would be light enough to shoot, but not yet. He lit another cigarette and looked out the window at the shadowed forest where the moose waited. Chet was a month from 42 years old and was the father of six with another on the way. If he turned his head, he could hear all of them breathing in their sleep and their mother with them. One of the kids stirred and he listened for a moment, then went to the coffee pot and poured a cup, added two sugars and a splash of milk. He sat at the kitchen table he'd built and blew smoke rings into the aroma of the coffee. Above his head, one of the two boys in the loft rolled and he imagined one of them tossing back the covers as the wood stoves chased the heat from the attic. The two older boys were bunked in the second bedroom and the girls were on a pallet in he and Briar's room where she was starting to stir as well, probably smelling the coffee. He checked the window again for the moose and he found that the morning light had grown so he could see its silhouette even through the double layers of plastic. The windows in the cabin were without glass, but glass would come, as would electricity, cupboards, and kitchen linoleum. In the spring, he would build another bedroom and a bath. For now, though, this was enough. His family sleeping around him and a fire to warm them all. The clock had swept well past eight o'clock when he finished his second cup of coffee and the first light of day streamed through the windows. He stepped out the back door again, but this time he took down the out six. The moose had turned sideways, and when it started to walk, Chet quickly squeezed the trigger. The moose kept moving, and he fired again. This time, it went down, and he could go into the warm cabin to get a coat and boots. By then, Briar was up and big-eyed. What in the world, Peabody, she said. He just laughed. Put some breakfast on, woman. We got a moose to butcher, and get those kids up to help. Briar smiled. You aren't wasting the morning, are you? And then as if they weren't all roused by the shooting, come on kids, you're wasting the day. Your dad's got a moose down. Tom and Mike bustled out of the bedroom and Amy pushed into the middle of what was ever going on. Bill and I scrambled down the ladder and rushed out in our pajamas to ogle the wonder that our father had wrought at dawn's breaking. Only Peggy had to be pulled out of bed, angry at giving up the warmth of the morning blankets. Mom made more coffee and started a batch of biscuits, while Tom and Mike dressed to go outside. In the morning twilight, they each grabbed a hairy leg and helped their father gut and skin his first moose. Dad was a homestead hunter without license or season, so he and the boys hauled the skin, guts, and head of the animal to the side site of the last bonfire, heaped slash on it, and started a fire to cover the evidence. The carcass was cut into quarters and stashed in snow banks, and clean snow was shoveled over the blood stains, all done before breakfast. Then they sat down to biscuits and moose steaks, sliced thin, fried, and covered in gravy, the first meal of the new year in their new home. Tomorrow, Chet would go to Homer and look for work. I was the youngest in that cabin, so my bed was in the rafters with my brother Bill and we climbed a ladder and crawled under army blankets and old quilts beneath the sloping rough cut rafters. Warmed by the stove, the green rafters and the snowboards oozed pitch that dripped onto our blankets and added the scent of evergreen to the smell of sawdust and last night's supper. Until the fire died late at night, we would be hot, probably too hot some nights, and then the cold would eventually creep in between the wood, tar paper, wood and the tar paper, making us huddle together under our blankets. Bill told me stories of forts we'd build next summer, and I felt so grown up there with my 11-year-old brother in the loft of our cabin in the woods as we planned our great adventures. I'm going to stop there. All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moose hunts. Uh, you've written about moose hunts before. Yeah. And, and back home. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's good. And when did that book come out? This came out in 2019. 
2019. If okay. I remember correctly, yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and and right. uh, I'm eager to hear about the red squirrels. Okay. All right. I will. Um, <clears throat> let me find. Um, I can do here. <clears throat> this is chapter one of Squirrel Land. Uh, let's imagine. The wolf exerts a powerful influence on the human imagination. It takes your stare and turns it back on you. Very low paths of wolves and men. I've only seen a handful of wolves in the wild, all sightings along a river. The lone wolf loping on a beach or a pack lounging in the sun. So what I know about wolves is a mixture of reading, a few sightings, and my imagination for I've never followed one in the woods to study it for myself. The same is true for all animals. I've watched many moose blend silently into the trees, huge animals that disappear instantly like pale smoke. And once they fade from sight, I can only imagine what they do. Imagining is what we must do as we follow the wanderings of the red squirrel. I ask that you go along with me on a short journey by mixing our experiences with squirrels, both wild and urban, with the work of researchers and our imaginations, we can together consider the North American red squirrel in the wilderness of interior Alaska. Let's imagine a North American red squirrel running along a gnarled spruce branch, a solemn route taken uh, many times before, its movement unique among tree dwellers, its explosiveness eye blinking. It leaps to a higher branch and stops in a heartbeat. It wastes no energy, every twitch purposeful. With its head rock still, it can scan the surroundings with excellent color vision. Its pale yellow lenses function much like sunglasses. It can focus across the retina, meaning it processes superb vision out the sides of its eyes. Humans have a peripheral vision, but with a marred out of focus image, whereas a red squirrel can clearly see the designs of a fluttering butterfly off to its side without moving its head. The squirrel appears to be weightless. It bounds into the autumn air to another branch and runs through the spruce tips and balances there on the slender ends, hind feet gripping the waving and bouncing boughs. A nine ounce diminutive super athlete, all muscle speed and agility, masters the high bar of the wilderness, the wobbly tip of a white spruce. At birth, it weighed half an ounce, a helpless hairless peanut with little chance to ever leave the nest. Its eyes stayed closed for nearly a month. This squirrel is from the order Rodentia, uh, Scaruridae, and its scientific name is, is Tamia curious Hudsonicus. It's the only squirrel I've seen at our place in the boreal forest of interior Alaska. But there is another. Flying squirrels also live in the trees here. But after poking around in the woods, I've never seen one, so I'll let them be and focus only on the red squirrel. And I've seen dozens of them through the years, dashing through horsetail and rose bushes to tree trunks. <clears throat> Dodging spruce hen and spruce grouse along the way. My imaginary squirrel picks its way into a dense growth of spruce cones and begins biting through the soft stems and tossing the cones to the ground, sometimes in clusters of three or four, each landing with a soft thud near the base of the tree, a unique sound in the forest. As it jerks its head to toss the cones, the hair on its head is illuminated by a ray of light, revealing the color that explains its name, a burnt red, warm, earthy color. Its belly is white, as are, are the circles around each eye. Its tail, often stretched for balance, is tipped in dense black and gray hairs. These tail hairs have bands of color, meaning a strand of hair has different colors. I haven't noticed much variation in the color of red squirrels. They all look about the same to me, donned in a rich coat with a remarkable ability to disappear in a shadow. They do, though, appear in different sizes. Young squirrels, not long out of the nest, look like little adults. 
After throwing a dozen clusters from the tree, the squirrel descends again, dashing, jumping, and freezing in its steps. And on the ground now, with the cone at its feet, it pauses to eat one. Along the, above the tree canopy, a bald eagle catches a thermal beneath a cumulus cloud and soars, turning, dipping, and radically climbing, and most certainly looking for something to eat. The squirrel now on his haunches holds the cone in his hand and pulls away the scales, also called brats with its incisors, eating the seeds beneath. Its fourth finger, commonly referred to as a ring finger by humans, is its longest, presumably the extra length helpful while gripping branches. Soon a small pile of, of spruce scales form at its feet. It grabs a band of cones and darts to a midden at the base of a spruce. The eagle, soon to become a dot in the blue, follows the cumulus into the distance. With danger mom momentarily absent, the squirrel sings. Yes, sings. I've never heard a squirrel sing, but I can imagine it. A story passed down by distant ancestors in southwest Alaska tells the story of a squirrel, and it could have been a red squirrel, that sings to a raven blocking access to its den. The raven begins to dance to the squirrel's song, and the squirrel slips inside. This story is recounted in a remarkable book. They say they have ears to the ground, Animal Essays from Southwest Alaska. My wife, Doyle Ann, and I, near the end of five weeks at our homestead watching squirrels, during our best to extend our stay to the last days before the river turns sluggish with ice, and we must head back to town. We closely watch the river and clouds while frozen leaves fall upon us, colorful leaves falling heav heavily falling like Newton's apple to a hardening earth. Thousands of leaf leaves blanket our yard. A single large deciduous tree might have more than 30,000 of them. And here along a stretch of river between Denali and the Yukon River, trees stand thick as br br bristles on a brush. And under a thick canopy of paper birch, yellow and russet leaves, all together in the cold. We'll soon depart for town where we'll, we'll spend the winter, but the river, the clouds, the dead leaves, and the noisy squirrels will stay. So that's chapter one of Squirrel Land. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I love the, I love the imagery that you impart. I think even people who don't visit, that haven't visited Alaska will be able to feel and sense that. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. Yeah, it's yeah. it's fun. Yeah, good to hear. And and uh, I look forward to the memoir, the Homestead memoir. Uh, right. Definitely get to that. That's for sure. So I guess we're done. And so I hope everyone out there spends a little extra time reading this week during Book Week. Um, oh yeah, and uh, yes, again a thanks to. Uh, Book Week for including us, Alaska Book Week for including us in their celebration of Alaska books. Yep. And um, yeah, thank you all very much. And thank you to Trish Jenkins for making this work. Yes. <laughs> right. So long. We'll talk soon. <laughs>